Felix, who have been walking us through uh, the confession, particularly uh, uh, chapter 7, and I think he has dealt with paragraph 1 and paragraph 2, right? And sufficiently. I listen in the first, the first one, the one he was accusing me of doing something. Oh, what was he accusing me of doing something? I don't know, I was accused of, um, it will come to me now. So I, I was innocent. I actually wanted to, to call my innocence. Uh, but last week I joined, but uh, I, didn't, I couldn't have enough reception uh, to finish through. But I think uh, we have dealt with paragraph one and paragraph two sufficiently. Paragraph one basically established uh, covenants, uh, and I think he tried to define the word covenant and why and how it matters to us as Christians. And the, the dealings of God with people before the fall and after the fall has always been on the platform of covenant. Is that what we are teaching there? That the platform where which God interacts with human beings before and post fall is usually on the ground of covenant. And this covenant is not like of course, it's an agreement, but it's not like an agreement between two equal partners. <laughs> the distance between us and God, the chasm between us and God is unimaginable, is unthinkable. It is unthinkable that we and God could ever sit on a table and then God bring his own 50% and then we bring our own 50%. No. Secondly, God does not even owe us any relationship. Creation of human beings uh, were not necessary. We are not necessarily being, as far as the being of God is concerned. What that means is that with us, uh, without us, God is complete. God, our creation, our creation was not uh, in order that some needs in God could be met. So if God chose to relate with us at any level is condescension. It is grace. It is covenant. And I think the second paragraph actually dealt with the issue of the covenant of redemption, true or false. Were we able to talk about covenant of redemption? Just like I am. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I also want to read from you. Give me that. Give me that. Let me read paragraph two. If you are, if you have joined for the first time, you are going through the uh, second, the Baptist Confession of Faith, called the 1689, and we are looking at the subject of the covenant, uh, uh, God's covenant, God's covenant. Uh, paragraph two of uh, chapter seven said, "Moreover, this is uh, a more with a master's uh, business. Moreover." As man had brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace. In this covenant, he freely offered to sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring from them faith in him that they may be saved. I'm, prom I'm promising to give to all who are appointed to eternal life, his Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. Okay? Uh, this covenant, I'm, doing, I'm reading paragraph three now, so I can have it now. What is it that you guys learned last week? If you didn't learn the current of redemption, Brown did like this general, like like you learned. Uh, we learned a lot. Brown, what did you guys learn last week? What can you remember from your lesson last week? Let me not run ahead of myself. Felix, your mic. Brother Felix took us through the 
covenants that we don't, um, I mean, throughout the entire scriptures from that of that with Noah, that with Abraham, that with Jacob, that with David, then the eventual one with um, Christ. So we're just going through the covenants that have been uh, uh, in the scriptures. Yeah, so that's why I did it. And you're doing that through because we're looking at paragraph two? Yes. Okay. And uh, what was his conclusions? He was making us understand um, the nature of the kind of covenant. He was speaking of the fact that covenant, the covenant is, is by grace. Mm -hmm. That is that man, man's participation in the covenant is on the basis of grace. A man cannot actively... Uh, so he, he was unpacking that phrase, covenant, covenant of, of grace. Yes. Oh, now I understand. Now I understand. So you didn't hear from his lips, covenant of redemption. Okay, give him a microphone. I spoke about the uh, two different dimensions mm -hmm. of the covenant of grace, where the latter part of the paragraph two. Where the offering of of um, of the God of the gospel of grace universally and mm -hmm. the particular dimension in terms of the application of the gospel of grace to a particular people yeah, that was where I rounded up um, the covenant of redemption was what was I was going to speak about in from uh, paragraph three. Mm. Okay, let's read paragraph three. I will just try to say a few things. If you have I've, uh, given paragraph three in, on the WhatsApp group, and there's also a, a diagram that best illustrates what I'm about to say tonight on the WhatsApp group. Is it there? Can you respond? Is it there? Okay. You can see it, it is there. And then the, the, the paragraph three also is there. Prophet, you don't have anything back for me. No book, nothing, nothing. Where's your, where's your book? This covenant, that is the covenant of grace, is revealed in the gospel, first of all, to Adam, in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman and afterwards by further steps or father steps until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament. And it is founded in that inner covenant transaction that was between the father and the son about the redemption of the elect. And it is alone by the grace of this covenant that all the posterity of fallen Adam that ever were saved did obtain life and bless and blessed immortality. Man being now utterly incapable of acceptance with God upon those terms on which Adam stood in his state of innocence. Now, there are three covenants. I'm sure Felix must have mentioned to you the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace. Because it's just a Bible study in a local assembly, I won't bore you with, I will not make it like, I will, I will not be elaborate. Okay. Now, the, the idea of the, the covenant of works happened when? It's between God and who? You guys were here, and the covenant of works between God and who? Adam. And then what happened to that covenant? Who broke it? Adam broke the covenant of works. And then, that is from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. That is the dispensation of the covenant of works. I'm careful. The word dispensation, don't take it to be a dispensational theology. I'm talking about period, okay? Where with 
the covenant of works reigns. And Adam was under probation that if he obey uh, the terms of that covenant, he will enjoy immortality. But he broke the covenant and then consequently brought curse on himself and his posterity. The reason why the curse that came upon him flowed, flowed over to his posterity, it is because Adam was the federal head. Put this word here, federal head, federal head, federal head, okay? And, uh, and you are going to see this word federalism and, and covenant a lot uh, in, within this. Uh, let me not just take you there, okay? Then, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, after Adam fell and Eve, God now initiates the covenant of grace. Quick, a quick caveat. Many of you are going to say okay, there's no phrase called covenant of grace in the Bible, covenant of redemption in the Bible. Yes. In the same way, you don't have the word Trinity in the Bible. It is the implications of what God does through the pages of the scripture that brings about the phrase. So don't quickly discard uh, those things for the sake of your own personal convenience. So what the confession is saying is that this covenant of grace, I hope... Felix did not say last week that those covenants just have made it in and of themselves. Okay. Uh, the, I don't want to go back to last week. I, I, I was not, uh, the covenant of grace as distinct from covenant being on the basis of grace. The idea of covenant, and what Felix was teaching us this past week was that, that God should enter into a covenant with us, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with Adam and all that, is on the basis of grace. It's a condescension. It is different from the theological category of a word called covenant of grace. And what the confession is saying is that God revealed this covenant in the gospel, what we call the proto euangelion the gospel that was preached to in the Garden of Eden, and that is the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, regarding the seed of the woman that shall, the seed of the woman that shall bruise the head of the serpent. And this gospel was first of all preached to Adam and in the promise of salvation by the seed of woman. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And afterwards, by further steps, until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament, what the confession is saying is that, as God announced this covenant of grace to Adam, that the seed of the woman is going to undo what Satan had done in the garden. Uh, it, it's, God continued to reveal that promise by further steps. So it was preached in the garden like this and then continued to expand until it's full of accomplishment in the New Testament in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us read Romans chapter 16, verse 25 to 27. Romans chapter 16, verse 25 to 27. Another person can read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. Romans. Romans Chapter 16, verse 25 to 27. Romans 16, 25 to 27. Yeah. Now unto him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Okay, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. Which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, and in, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Okay, so this covenant of grace was not like was not clear under the old uh, under the old covenant, was not clear in the Old Testament, but but things were were were, were in in forms in the prototype in shadow until they find their fulfillment in Christ. And that's the sentiment of Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and Hebrew verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. And, and, and the reason why this is quite key is, is this. You recall that any time we look through the confessions, I will try to remind you, what were our forefathers fighting? Every single paragraph, chapters of the confessions were meant to target a particular error. Of course, of course, at the back of their mind, they were trying to crystallize the doctrine of the scripture, but there were some other errors that they were trying to fight. It is this particular place that our Baptist forefathers disagree with the Presbyterians, the pedo-baptists. We are credo-baptists, they are pedo-baptists. I hope you understand the difference now. If you go to a church, a, a Presbyterian church, where they will practice infant uh, baptism, uh, uh, and we don't practice infant baptism, the reason is because we believe in believers' baptism and they believe in infant baptism. It is at this point the disagreement uh, comes. Our forefathers. Because our confession, this confession was consistent with the, sixth, with, with the Westminster Confession of the Presbyterian. Okay? And then, but this place, they differ. And we talk about the Presbyterian and the, and the, and the Congregationalists. We're talking about people like John Owen, people like what? Mention their names. You don't know their names again. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Yeah, okay, contemporary time, Sproul is a Presbyterian. John MacArthur is a credo Baptist. Yes? Who else can you link to? John MacArthur is a, is, is, is a, I said a credo Baptist. Yeah, it's a credo Baptist, I said. Not a, not a pedo. Pedo is, yeah, yeah? Okay, so these are the things, okay. Now, let me come down to explain to you why these things matters. I want to read in your hearing, the difference, uh, the, the Westminster version of this particular paragraph. Their own is in chapter, uh, chapter 7, paragraph 5. Our own is in chapter 7, paragraph 3. Let me read our own and compare it with the Westminster. This covenant is revealed in the gospel, first of all to Adam, in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman, and afterwards by further steps, until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament. And it is, it, is, it is founded in the eternal covenant transaction that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect. And it is alone by the grace of this covenant that all the posterity of fallen Adam that ever were saved did obtain life and blessed immortality, man being now utterly incapable of acceptance with God upon those terms on which Adam stood in the state of innocence. Look at what the Presbyterian, the Westminster one said. This covenant, see we have the same disco, this covenant, was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Paschal Lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith 
in the promised Messiah by whom the heart full remissions of sins and eternal salvation and it is called the Old Testament. Yeah, the way you guys are looking at me, yeah. I doubt if you understand what I'm just saying. How many of you, uh, just raise your hand if you are following me. Um, oh, shit. Raise your hand if you're not following me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not difficult. Okay, the Presbyterians are saying we both believe in the, in the both the, the Pedro Baptist and the Credo Baptist believe in the covenant of grace. That the platform, now I'm coming down, eh? the platform by which redemption comes to us, to the elect, is through, is because of the covenant, is through the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace is a midwife. Christ came on the back of the covenant of grace. It is a covenant of grace that God initiates in the Garden of Eden after Adam fell that brought Christ, that brought redemption. Is that one clear? Is that one clear to this point? Now, the difference begins now. The Baptists are saying that this covenant, the moment God initiated it in the Garden of Eden, begins to be revealed to humanity through further steps. What that means is that from being a tiny uh, kind of utterance, I mean the gospel has preached uh, through the mouth of God in the garden, all the, all the circumstances and, and dispensations and structures happens as foreshadowing, as pointing to the fulfillment of that covenant. That the covenant of grace was not efficacious and does not really happen in the Old Testament. What that means is that the sacrificial system of the Old Testament were not actually saving anybody. It was pointing to the Messiah. Because each covenant does have a head. The head of the covenant of works is who? Church, the, prime, the human head of the, of, of the works covenant is who? Who is the human head of Noahic Noahic covenant? Who is the human head of Abrahamic covenant? Who is the human head of the Mosaic covenant? Who is the human head of the Davidic covenant? Who is the, who is the human head of the covenant of grace? Now, uh, that one, is that one clear now? Mm -mm, it's not clear. Jesus is the head of the covenant of grace. All that happened in the Old Testament were just a foreshadowing. Things kept happening in a more fuller and fuller and fuller sense until uh, consummation. I think it was Galatians 4 verse 4 that talked about the fullness of time, the pleroma of time, Christ came. Now, the Presbyterian differ. They are saying the covenant of grace has happened in the garden begins to be unfolded in the Old Testament by way of various administrations. Okay. Lord, help me to say this in the simple way. What they're saying is this. The, the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant of grace. It's a different way by which that covenant was administered. It is efficacious. That's what uh, the Westminster is saying, is that 
that the covenant was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. So under the law, it was administered by promises, Abraham, by prophecies, by sacrifices, mosaic, by circumcision, Abrahamic, by Pascal lamb, mosaic, and other types. And these things were happening, even though they put the word that was signifying Christ, but they now add this line that, that which were for that time sufficient and efficacious. What that means was that the Abrahamic covenant is an administration of the covenant of grace. Noahic covenant is an administration of the covenant of grace. Mosaic covenant is an administration of the covenant of grace. Davidic covenant is an administration of the covenant of grace. And then the New Testament, the New Covenant, is also an administration of the covenant of grace. It is one covenant, one essence, but different administrations. And all of these administrations does have, have efficacy and, and was sufficient. What does this thing sound like in your hearing? So they were saying that Christ was in the covenant of Noah, saving people at that time. So the, so the Baptists look at the Noahic covenant as the ark pointing to salvation in Christ. Presbyterian are saying that the, the, the ark itself, yes, there was, Christ was in the ark saving Noah people. Abraham covenant, they were saying, was, was sufficient and efficacious. Christ was in the covenant, covenant of Abraham, saving people. Christ was in the Paschal Lamb, saving people. And it is, it is, it is. Of course, what they were pointing to was that each covenant, you know, that's where the Presbyterians are saying that circumcision and baptism cohere. That baptism in the new covenant is, uh, 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 is, is that bapt what baptism, what infant baptism is in the new covenant is what circumcision is under the old covenant. So what they are saying is that each covenant have its seal, have its sign. What is the sign of Noahic covenant? What is the sign of Noahic covenant? Rainbow. What is the sign of Abrahamic covenants? What is the sign of Mosaic covenants? The law. The covenant. <laughs> so, so I, I'm not saying, or it was, but that is, they are getting somewhere. And what is the sign of the new covenants? Baptism is, in, is, is, the, is the initiation into the new covenants. So baptism, uh, the, uh, so that the way the Old Testament saints were circumcised, both Esau and Jacob were circumcised. Esau and Jacob, one was a believer, one was, one was an unbeliever. Ishmael was an unbeliever. Isaac was a believer. All had the circumcision upon them. So when the child is born into a church, you're not going to wait for that child to show the sign of conversion. You baptize that child because already it's in the covenant. And they, believe, they argue that in the, under the old covenant, people under the old covenant are always mixed multitudes. I don't want to teach their theology, okay? But let me teach Baptist theology. What we are saying is, no, 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 no. People under the old covenant, the sacrificial system, all the, all, there were types and shadow of Christ that after Adam fell, no one can be saved apart from Christ. And the Old Testament saints were putting their trust in Christ, looking forward. Because the covenants were in form of promises. And that promise is culminated in Christ. That is further steps. It's the same covenant. Not different administration. It's the same covenant until his fulfillment happened in Christ. Not further, not different administrations. One covenant, not different administrations. One covenant, further steps. And Jesus is the head 
of the new covenant. I don't have time to talk about the, the relationship between the covenant head and his people. The reason why you benefit from the covenant of grace is that you are in Christ. You are linked to him and you are participant of that covenant. That is for the first part of paragraph three. This is not too far from this dispensational theology that talks about different dispensations. Oh, so the, this afternoon, I think you guys were in my bed, you said something about this. Talking about seven dispensations and all that stuff. I don't want to go there. Second part. Okay, let me just read some wardrobe on this before I move on. He said, the thematic unity of the covenant means that that they have a single ultimate theme or purpose. The text that epitomizes and summarizes this point is Ephesians 2, verse 12. Samuel Waldron went to Ephesians 2, verse 12. write it down. Ephesians 2, verse 12. They will explain this point further. And he said, which literally translated speak of the covenants of the promise. What specific promise Paul has in mind may not be clear. But it is clear that all the covenants were the development of one single promise. You understand? All the covenants were the development of one single promise, not many promises. And this thematic unity can be seen in a key recurring phrase or theme that occurs in the divine covenants. I will be your God and you shall be my people. Genesis 17 verse 7 to 8, Exodus 25 verse 8, Exodus 6, verse 6 to 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 16, Jeremiah 31, 33, Revelation 21, verse 3. The great promise of all the covenant is fulfilled in Christ and in the new covenant. John chapter 1, verse 14, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, 23, and now emphatically God is with man. The reference in Ephesians 2 verse 12 to the covenants of the promise is crucial. It asserts that all the divine covenants relate to the unfolding of the single promise of salvation. If Paul is referring specifically to the promise of a redeemer initially given in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, then the following very brief survey of the divine covenants manifests they are relation to the promise. And it's going to run through the covenants. Why? The covenant with Noah is given as a framework in which creation will be preserved by common grace until the fulfillment of the promise. The covenant with Abraham formally initiates that community through which the promised redeemer will come. The Mosaic covenant provides the necessary regulation and legislation for that, for that community at that time when it has ceased to be a family and has become a nation. In so doing, God also provides a full revelation of the nature and necessity of the re response owed to this covenant of grace. In the Davidic covenant, God's rule over his people is given concrete manifestation in so doing, the line through which the Redeemer will come is specified. In the new covenant, the Redeemer appears and accomplishes salvation or accomplishes redemption, thus bringing to fruition all the types and predictions of the earlier covenant. He inaugurates the final form of the covenant community. Amen. 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 I, I don't want to go through, I don't want to touch the other part of the time is gone. So next week I'll talk about the covenant of redemption and then the, there are about three parts in, there are three parts in paragraph three. But what you have learned tonight is that because if you are, if, if you are not careful the Achilles heels that have dug many deviant forms of Christian practices, particularly in Africa and some part of the world, is the fact that you are looking at the Old Testament and what you can see 
is that God is using various means to save people. And cross is one of those means. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you go to the Old Testament, they are looking at Noah as a covenant head. What you are seeing in Noah, the covenant God was making with Noah, was not of a redemptive value. It, it is under the rubric of common grace covenants attached to the covenant of works. We have only one Messiah. We have only one Redeemer, as promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Christ, the seed of the woman. And God continues to promise, to promise, to sound that gospel, to repeat that gospel again and again under different dispensation until Christ came, the head of the new covenant came, and then fulfill uh, the requirement of the law and save his elect. So the Old Testament saints believe in Christ. They put their faith in Christ through those systems, but they were looking forward. They have faith. They were looking forward. Hebrews 11, they were looking forward. We are saved. We're looking backward. All of us meet at the, at the cross. There's no two ways to God. There's no two ways that God was saving people in the Old Testament. The, the, the Paschal Lamb were shadow. They are types of Christ. That is one of the big things I want us to learn tonight. Don't run to the Old Testament and then you're making quick applications as if uh, God was saving people. You know, some of our... Oh. We hear some pastors who are even using sand, you know, as they call it uh, spiritual weapons, no? They say, bring the sand. Oh, I, I, I challenged one woman some years ago that we said we should go and stay in her prayer camp for 14 days or for seven days. And I said, what are you doing, madam? This is not biblical. He said, oh, but Elisha told Naaman to go and dip his body in Jordan for seven times. So there are some people are becoming audacious now. They could even, there are some churches that will say, bring, bring a ram. And then they will sacrifice a, a, a ram. In fact, I was part of a church around 1996 in the city of Cardona, where the pastor was giving a testimony how HIV AIDS were healed. The lady was about to die. So they, they drew a cycle. They put a lady in the cycle. And then they prayed, they prayed. And then he asked her to buy a big ram. So as the prayer came to a head, the, the ushers, some ushers were holding the ram and some ushers were holding the woman. So when he gave, gave instructions, the woman was dragged out of the cycle and then the ram was thrown into the cycle and was, and, and was uh, 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 slaughtered. And then the woman lived, the ram died. It's called atonement. I recall many years ago in that same church, I mean, I spent like a year and a half in that church, we, they asked us to bring sand, to bring mud as a representative of, of that God made man from the, dust, from, from the dust of the earth. And the pastor gave elaboration on the kind of dust that God made man from, that the dust is not, it's not, it's not yellow dust, it's not a red sand, it is this like ash, this, this clay, clay sand of ash color. So we're all around Cardinal looking for the particular type of the clay that God made man from. And then we made a ball and said, this clay now is, 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 is represents you. And then you are speaking life into the clay and all that stuff. And people, educated people were doing it. Of course, I did it. And then... Uh, of course, I was the peer to the pastor. At the end of, of the service, of, of, the, of the week conversion, the, the, the thing we were using before turned to our enemy. It's okay, this, this now, you are finished with you now. Take, take another lump of that sand again and make it look like your enemies. Bring needle and start choking your enemy on the head. You are doing this thing. And at the end of the service, we all submitted the sand and we went home. I was called by around 11 p.m. in the night to the church to help 
bury those things under the pulpit. It's called idolatry. All that happened in the Old Testament are not driven at the ministration of the covenant of grace. They were pointing to if, if, if all you learn tonight is this, you are fine. David and Goliath points to who? Points to who? Christ. You cannot just jump and make Goliath your father-in-law or your mother-in-law and then the five stones, J-E-S-U-S. Actually, the, the name Jesus is not even five. It's sorry, Yeshua. It's more than five letters, actually. And then you are throwing stones at people. That's not true. That's not true. When we come to David and Goliath, we are looking at David being the Christ, the, 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 the prophetic Christ. And all the Psalms were written about who? About Christ. When David said, I shall not die but live, is he speaking about you or Christ? Because David himself died and his tomb is with us. The Old Testament were not different at the ministration. When Adam fell, God was not saying, let's try thing. Let, let us, let's try, let's try different. So, with Nohaic uh, dispensation, God tried something, but Christ was the, the active agent walking through the ark. Then that didn't work. Then Abrahamic covenant, Christ was the active ingredient walking under the Abrahamic covenant, didn't work. And then continually until Christ himself said, since Joshua and dead, they're not, let me just go myself and finish this. So Christ become one, one of the administration of the covenant of grace. Christ is not one of the administration of the covenant of grace. Christ is the head of the covenant of grace. Christ is the covenant of grace. And it is only through him that all fallen race of Adam can be saved. That's the lesson we learned tonight. The second lesson, and this is just by the way, is the way of appreciation. The Westminster fathers were far ahead of the Baptist fathers in terms of education. When talking of Owen, we're talking about Westminster fathers, the Puritans. We talk of secular education, enlightenment, and everything. They are far ahead. Most Baptist fathers were non educated people, they were farmers. They were half big educated people. They were common people. They were not landowners. People like Benjamin Kitch and so on and so forth. They were not like very, very educated. But as they were examining the Westminster Confession and they examined the Savoy Declaration, Westminster being the Presbyterian and the Savoy being the, the Congregational, they, they, they came to a conviction that this does not represent the scripture. And they were able to differ without insulting the sensibility of the other people. They differ clearly, humbly, lovingly, but firmly. And we are lacking men now that have balls. Like as, they said, if Asabutu believed that, who are we? Uh -uh. Not who are we. The scripture. The scripture. All of us sit under the, the scripture is the magisterium. We sit under the scripture. And if the teaching teaching of Koran Mbewe, teaching of Vodi Bokham, teaching of MacArthur, teaching of Arshus Kural, teaching of uh, Paul Walsher, teaching of uh, who else? Name them. Pastor Osnachi, teaching of Osage. All our teachings are examined by the scripture. And if our teachings fall short of the scripture, it must be discarded quickly. It should not be endured and said, to, who are we? Who holy pass? If the teaching of Papa Adebo, the teaching of, of the winners, all the teachings of the so-called great men must be examined. Not by sentiment. Not saying, no, we know they're speaking in tongues. <laughs> Is that examine what they are saying. And, 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 and uh, Kumui, I, I ran through some clip of Kumui recently, last week. I, I, don't, I was trying to tell you today. And Kumui was saying, Kumui was just trying to rebuke his church members. He said, well, what are we doing to ourselves? We will come to church. They say, let us give thanks to God. We are speaking in tongues. Let us confess our sins. We are speaking in tongues. Let us pray for Nigeria. We are speaking in tongues. 
I was preparing his own, preparing his own congregation. And he even points to the area where those things are coming from. He said, all of you from the east. Every doctrine must be examined. Must be examined thoroughly. We must all be Bereans. Brother Brown must be examined. Don't say it sounds so good. I was listening to a man Elias. I was listening to a clip today. There's a man of God that one big church are invited. And the guy is preaching Adulam, the cave of Adulam. Adulam experience. The way the man is speaking, all he was saying is actually nonsense. But, but they are high sounding nonsense. He said, Adulam is where divinity penetrates humanity. That Adulam is where you take non entity to, and the, the original intent and content and essence are reprogrammed. Now, it does not sound big. That every person existed before, before eternity began. And you are corrupted by Satan. So God will take you to the cave of Adulam. Now you are, even, you are looking at where is Adulam, by the way. Because all those guys, they will talk about David and his men in the cave of Adulam. They will talk about it. And towards the end, they will say, this ministry is your Adulam. You are hooked now. <laughs> the only way Joshua can be better in life is to remain in Adulam. If you step out, you become useless. Examine the scripture. Two things we've learned tonight. The fact that our forefathers, the Baptist fathers, were able to look at the Westminster fathers and say, no, this does not represent the scripture, needs our careful attention to learn. Number two, we should, we should make sure we understand this. The covenant of grace was a covenant that brought Christ, and Christ is the head of that covenant. The part we are going to look next week is that the covenant of grace was an outflow of the covenant of redemption. We'll look at that one next week. Any question before we pray? Brown. It's not a question. It's just to see if I got all what has been said. Yes. So is that the defining line between the Westminster and the Baptist is while the West, Westminster believe that salvation occurred individually in those covenants, mm -mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Baptist is saying that salvation occurred at Christ. So is that those people, they were not saved in those covenants, but is that when Christ came, that the, their promise was yeah, not the, created to them. The and, Old Testament saying that's the language our fathers use. They were saved retroactively. The work of Christ was applied to them Retroactively. Ima, what is that? Okay. Let me add to this. It doesn't mean that they were not saved at the time they were saved. It's not that they were sort of in a limbo, somewhere stuck yeah. between saved and unsaved. They were Christ came. They were now saved. They were saved by their belief in the promise. So there's only the promise looking forward. Abraham looked forward. Everybody looked forward. Yeah. So that looking forward, they were looking forward to Christ. To Christ. So their salvation is by believing in the promised Messiah, basically. That is the only Yes, you see, it is better you say things clearly so that you don't model the word. The reason why our Baptists and Westminster are working together is because of this. When Westminster took that stand, they kept us saying Christ was mentioned in all those, all those dispensations. But they are saying that those epochs or those covenants were different administration of the covenant of grace. Do you understand the word administration? That the covenant of grace were administered. That yes. Right. Yeah, Elias. Yeah, if, if I'm just going to add, what, what, what another major place where what, what pastor has been saying is for us, but is one covenant of grace progressively revealed and fully revealed in Christ in the new covenant. So it's not like these ones are different, it's one covenant, but it's as if you are learning, like we'll say something about the Hawaii covenant 
trying to explain something about the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant. They are all there's a thematic unity. There is one covenant. It's not like a separate covenant. But the full revelation of that covenant is found in Jesus Christ. So that's what we are saying. Now the Presbyterians are so they are so crazy about administration. So that would now make them focus a lot on the externals. That's why they can now carry circumcision and link it to yes. the new covenant. But we are saying, see the full revelation here. Forget all those sacraments, whatever they are doing there, in all of those things. Now you have the full thing. Why should you not be running back to Moses to start baptizing your children? You That's see, we have the Praetorian actually will understand what you are saying. But if they agree with what you are saying, they will not baptize infants. You must find a framework to make sure you baptize infants. Because you want to have children in your house and call them unbelievers. Because children are part of the covenant. So it is, if you keep it as a way of administration, each administration have its own sign and seal. So the sign of the new covenant, if you don't partition them into different administration now, each administration have its own sign. That is the sign, how do you enter into Abrahamic covenant? It is by circumcision. You cannot have this new covenant now and not have sign entrance. How do you enter into the church? What is the rights of pastors to the church, become members? Baptism. And they, they are saying even children ought to be part of the church. They might say, so baptism now grant, guarantee their entrance into the new covenant. But the mm. Presbyterians are not saying that they are saved. The Catholic says they are saved, but say they are not saved. But they are just member of the covenant. Yes, Eliezer. Yeah, just to add, I think this is where the madness now happens. For some of us who know a bit of churches, Jonathan Edwards was sacked from his church because if you now say children are members of the covenant, that means they start taking Holy Communion. After a certain age, so all of so your it, you now start causing a lot of issues. Yeah. Whereas you can just simply say, according to scripture, if you are, if you are a believer, you are baptized, you are a member of the church, yeah. then you give communion. So those issues you avoid them. Joshua, the man will come to you. Um, there's this phrase we've been saying. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't get it. And the more we say, the more I wonder about it, and yeah. it gives me so many questions. And it's this um, when we say. We are looking them. They were looking from behind, and they were looking to the cross yes. like that. Okay, see, <laughs> only issue is this: I can understand maybe from David. I can understand from now from from Noah. Mm -hmm. The people and the rest of his family. How can we say they were looking to Christ? They were looking like in the scripture. Is there a verse that we could pick and say they they had the concept of Christ and. I know why right? that's the thing Hebrews 11 but I want to, that was when they were saying it then where in it is Hebrews 11 and you're not wait, saying that, okay let me, let, me, <laughs> let me get what I'm trying to say someone has told you Hebrews 11 when we, when, we, when we go to Noah now mm -hmm. in, in, in the time of Noah wait and everything. No, by faith by faith by faith Noah built an ark by faith in who by faith in who are there two faiths? Well, there's okay, th th that there's no faith. How many faiths? One. Faith in who? In God. In God. Through who? Through Christ. Yes. If you understand the economy of the Godhead, who, cre who created this world? This world, who created it? Wait. Josh, God. Yes, sir. Through who? Through Christ. Who is the agency of creation? God. Through Christ. Who is the, who is the creator? God, who is the agency? Christ. Christ. Who applies? Okay, so in, in other words, mm -hmm. it was not explicitly stated. Hebrews, they are, they are showing you Hebrews now. Read, 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 read it. Read. By faith, Noah have been warned by, by God concerning event as yet unseen. Yes. In reverence. The Reverend Fear constructed an act for the saving of his household. Mm -hmm. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. <laughs> you have answered this come. The, righteous, the righteous that come by faith, and that is that is actually Romans. Yeah. The righteous that come by faith. 
There's only one righteousness that comes by faith, and it is, it is alien righteousness. It is found in Christ. And by this, he condemns the world. I mean, I can even say that there's other part, but Thomas felt, Emmanuel, leave for sure alone and talk to me. Where is the place of a covenant in infant salvation? Who is talking about infant salvation here? No, you talked about infant baptism. Yes, we don't believe in that. You don't believe in infant baptism? No. What about infant salvation? <laughs> I don't know. Why won't you answer the question? <laughs> I'm avoiding this question. <laughs> <laughs> if I ask your question again, I, know, I want to get what you are. What? You look, about, look, you look, look at the lessons we've learned tonight. Yes. What is your question here? Yes. So you talked about the covenant. Mm-hmm. In particular, the covenant of grace. Mm-hmm. Where is the covenant of grace in spite in respect to infant salvation? The confession said the elect children. Who died in their infancy are saved. The confession never contemplates salvation of living infants. Can an infant who does not have the consciousness or, or awareness to believe in Christ? That's why we leave that salvation. That's why we leave that matter open. Because the confession said the elect infants. We don't even know whether it's the Children of the elect or the infants that are elect. Because our election predates our existence, true or false. When were you elected? Yes, before the foundations of the world. Yes, but yes. So all those this category ma, is not within our contemplation. This is higher than us. We don't know who is elect, even as we sit here now. We don't know who is elect. We don't know who God has elected. Uh, so we don't even know. But we know, you and I understand, that we, are, we have been elected in God and chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And by now you must have learned what they call double predestination, which we don't have time to go into that this evening. So if the confession said, those children who are elected in God, before the foundation of the world, even though they have not come to the consciousness of faith, when they die in their infancy, are saved, that is consistent. In fact, some of the forefathers of the faith went further to even say, all infants that died in infancy, God will give them salvation. But that's not the, con- that, that's not the issue with the church. The issue with the church is with the adults, those who are now alive. I don't preach to those who are dead. I don't baptize those who are, been, who are dead. And I don't look at children. It's okay. Children, children, children. Because you came to Jesus and he blessed you, therefore you are saved. We will never say that. All my children are not saved yet. And I'm praying that God will save them in time. So I don't believe in children's salvation. But what's the confession? I know where you are going is the issue of infants that died. Okay? And... That can go either way. And I don't think I'm going to waste my time and talk about if I died when you don't have one that died. And nobody is even troubling himself about the one that died and all that stuff. It was an issue that they've dealt with in the confessions. I have my own interpretation to that. And in our own wisdom as a church, we leave that open for individual private interpretations. But we don't believe in infant salvation here. That's why we don't baptize infants. And we don't put infants into the church membership. But if a baby is born today and die, people worry themselves. What happened to this child that died? And some forefathers said, well, since they die, David, because David speak about his own son that died in infancy. Okay, I'm going to him. He will not come to me. So you can go do this. So please don't have, thank God you're not, Thank God you didn't die when you were a child. It is to you now the gospel applies. Have you put your faith in Christ? Yes. 
if I have my children grow up and they are adults in my house, I preach to them. And I pray that God will give them saving faith in due season. That's, that would be my concern. If I, if I have a child that died, I'll never bother myself whether he's in heaven or in hell. I'll not even go there. But some want to know, will I see my... Some even ask some question in church. My husband that died last year, will I see him in heaven? Okay, how do I know your husband is in heaven? That's why some church make sure a pastor buried their husband, even though they are not saved. They have this waku paganism kind of like that. If you bury somebody properly, he's in heaven. And if you look at some of our liturgy, from Anglican liturgy, which some of us have imbibed, are not helpful, as they are buried someone, where were you recently? They say, we, we now commit the body of Jones into your care, Father. Like when they were burying Elizabeth. They will now commit the body of Elizabeth, our dear queen, to the mother earth and to the care of, of you, our father in heaven, waiting for when you are going to raise her back to life in the days of resurrection. You are, you are speaking in a, so affirmatively as if you know that Elizabeth was in faith until the last minute of her life. Of course, it's okay. You are saying that potentially. That if she was in faith, all the things you are saying, her body is, is committed to the hand of God, and God will raise that body back to life on the last day. And that is also consistent. But if you are too, 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 too sure that since her name is Elizabeth, then it's in heaven, you are mistaken. We don't know. We don't know. And Martin Luther said, what is, what is above us uh, is beyond us. There's no any other person question. I think tonight we've learned one thing. One thing. It is one covenant, one covenant, one covenant, one promise that came to his full, full uh, uh, fulfillment in Christ Jesus. He is the head of the new covenant, and we are in him. And because we are in him, we are going to heaven because of him. We are not going to heaven on different tickets and flights. There's one flight, there's one ticket. It's Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ, and you're hoping that because you're a good person, you're a nice person. Uh, you can get to heaven through. Some people ask for their forefathers that died without the missionary. It's okay. That you are just on your own. Make sure you're in Christ and make sure that you are found in Christ even this evening. And finally, don't be afraid to search the scripture and to examine all teachings. It is, it is your life. It is your life. Let us pray. Uh, Father, as we depart from this house tonight, we ask for your grace and your blessing and take this word, plant it deep in our hearts that we might be people of faith that trust you for the saving of our souls. Bless our food, bless our sleep, and wake us up tomorrow into your goodness. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Good evening, church.